Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. My guest today is the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times bestselling author, Thomas E. Ricks. He is an advisor on national security at the New America Foundation, where he participates in its Future of War project. He was previously a fellow at the Center for New American Security and is a contributing editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, for which he writes the prize winning blog, The Best Defense. Ricks covered the U.S. military for the Washington Post from 2000 through 2008. Until the end of 1999, he had the same beat for the Wall Street Journal, where he was a reporter for 17 years. A member of two Pulitzer Prize winning teams, he covered U.S. military activities in Somalia, Haiti, Korea, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Kuwait, Turkey, Afghanistan, and Iraq. He is the author of several books, including The Generals, The Gamble, Churchill and Orwell, Making the Core, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Fiasco, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His most recent work is First Principles, What America's Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How That Shaped Our Country, which examines the influence classical philosophy had on the first four American presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of first principles, former Secretary of Defense General James Mattis writes, Ricks knocks it out of the park with this jewel of a book. On every page, I learn something new. Read it every night if you want to restore your faith in our country. We are very proud to have a Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times bestselling author with us today. Welcome, Mr. Ricks. Thank you. Good to be here. When you started researching and writing, did you think the Founding Fathers would be this popular? No, I didn't. I didn't think this book would be popular. I was amazed when it hit the New York Times bestseller list. I thought it was a sort of fairly remote, obscure book about some dusty subjects that were of interest to me, but it turns out a lot of other people have similar concerns to me. Mr. Ricks, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, in the holiday spirit, we have Samuel Adams Limited Edition Winter Lager from the Samuel Adams Brewing Company of Boston, Massachusetts. For the first time in 31 years, Sam Adams has updated their classic winter lager recipe to make it crisper and brighter. It's the same iconic beer with a wintry remix. This updated version is spiced with cinnamon, ginger, and orange peel for a deeper flavor and a malty finish that will warm you up on a cold December night. Remember, the best way to enjoy an episode is with one of our featured brews. And I would also like to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Simply click on the subscribe button on the directory that you use and get new material immediately when it's published. Subscribing is the only way to get new shows right away. And to the ever-expanding list of supporters and listeners from 40 countries and hundreds of cities across the United States, I would like to say thank you. And now, in honor of our virtuous founding fathers, steeped in the classics, I raise my Samuel Adams limited edition winter lager and say cheers. You describe the moment when you wake up a bit shaken and you develop a series of questions that you believe need to be answered. Maybe we all have taken American democracy a little bit for granted. What event startled you into writing First Principles? I think we've actually taken American democracy much too much for granted, and I worry that we're kind of drifting right now towards oligarchy. But we can talk about that later if we want. The event that really struck me was four years ago, the Wednesday after the presidential election of 2016. I woke up in the same house I'm talking 
to you from right now in rural Maine. And I thought to myself, what happened last night? Donald Trump got elected president. I don't understand why people think he should be president. I don't understand the conception of the country they seem to have. And I've been taught in college that if you want to figure out a basic problem, go back to the fundamentals. So I actually went downstairs to my library, took down my college copy of Aristotle's Politics, and began rereading Aristotle, his study of politics, in the context of the election of Donald Trump. Well, actually, one thing that jumped off the page at me was Aristotle's going through the various forms of government, and he comments in discussing oligarchy, that is, ruled by the rich, he says it is the least stable form of government. And that intrigued me. I thought, oh, that's a kind of warning sign that we're going to have a real roller coaster here with Trump as president. I don't think Aristotle would be surprised if Trump was elected and then was not re-elected. He would say that's consistent with his views of oligarchy, I think. But that embarked me on a four-year journey through Greek philosophy and history and then more to Rome. And I, more and more in Rome, as I noticed that the founding fathers, while influenced by Greece, were much more influenced by ancient Rome. And so I really delved into Roman history, and especially what they read, how they read it, what they made of it. For them, it was really key. They took their political vocabulary from the decline of the Roman Republic. This book is an intellectual journey of the first four presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. But those are very different men. They have different backgrounds and different beliefs. Let's start with George Washington, though, who most likely would have gotten a proper education in England, but his father dies and that changes for him. How is he exposed or influenced by the classics without that traditional academic structure? There's a saying among American historians that the more you learn about George Washington, the more you admire him. And I think that's true. I think writing this book, Washington and Madison really went up in my estimation. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson went way down. Washington is, as you say, an interesting figure because he did not receive a, a very good education at all. Never learned a foreign language, which is what the elites of the day were expected to know, French and maybe, maybe, maybe Latin, certainly Latin, and some Greek. He never learned that stuff, but he did pick up Roman classicism from the culture around him, a culture in which people named their horses the classical figures and the human beings they held captive as slaves. His favorite play was actually Cato, a play about a Roman statesman who really, for Washington, becomes the model to emulate. And it, the play was very popular in the 18th century. Two lines from it that resonate for us even today are, one character says he regrets that he has only one life to give for Rome, and another character says, give me liberty or give me death. Mm. And so Washington, who has a volcanic temper as a young man, learning needs to learn to control himself, and I think consciously emulates Cato. Cato is a statesman who opposes the rise of Julius Caesar. He is frugal, prudent, very reserved, and lets his deeds speak louder than his words. These are all things that Washington seeks to emulate, and I think does so successfully. And interestingly, I think he brings that the sort of the Cato qualities to the presidency. And as he seeks to put the flesh of norms on the bones of the Constitution, we get a presidency that he defines in a very Cato-like way. And that's, I think, one reason that somebody like Donald Trump shocks a lot of people, because he is not prudent, frugal, reserved, quiet, and letting deeds speak a lot of words. Was it expected in genteel society, say in uh, Virginia, for those individuals to be versed in the classics? Absolutely for elites. Now, remember, we're talking about a very small group of people. There were only a handful of colleges in America before the Revolution. I think six or seven, and then maybe eight by the time the King's College, now Columbia, starts in New York. And there were only a few thousand people with college education in a country of millions. So these people tended to know each other, and they had this common vocabulary of the classics. And I think it actually is one thing that helped hold this very diverse country together, is that 
people from Massachusetts and people from South Carolina came from very different cultures, but the wealthiest, the people who were the large landowners, the major public men, would have this common language of Greek and Latin and their understanding of especially Roman history. Is there a difference between someone who can read Latin, say like Thomas Jefferson, as he receives the philosophy of the the Romans? Is there a difference between someone who can get it directly and someone like Washington who has to get it when it's already been interpreted by someone else? Washington, as far as we know, didn't even read this stuff in translation. He didn't read a lot of ancient and Greek Roman literature. What we know from his library and his notations about reading, for most of his life, he read a little bit of military history. He read a little bit more during the revolution, specifically on indirect warfare. And then he read a lot about farming all of his life. And then interestingly, after the presidency in the late 1790s, just before he died, he starts reading about abolition. He starts reading pamphlets about how do we end slavery. But Washington is like a lot of people who are very smart but not well-educated. He becomes very good at learning from experience. And he has real experiences before the French and Indian War as an envoy for the colonial governor of Virginia. Then during the French and Indian War, when he sees this terrific defeat of the British by the French and Indians are now doing business as First Peoples or Native Americans. And then as a fairly young commander-in-chief of the U.S. Army during the Revolution, he takes top command at the age of 43 over a non-existent army starts putting that army together in his mid-40s and really makes adjustments in his approach to warfare. And I found this fascinating, partly because I think American historians have dropped the ball on this. Academic historians don't really understand military operations. They don't even try on many occasions. I think that's true. And even when they try, they get it very wrong. I mean, well-known historians like Joseph Ellis and other people just don't seem to understand what Washington is doing. And we can know this today because All of Washington's letters and documents and diaries are all online, searchable. And so we can know much more about Washington than his contemporaries did. And you can see him evolve as a commander. He begins the revolution as a pretty conventional, offensive-minded warrior, probably pretty much like the British officers he was facing. He tries that offensive approach. It fails miserably. He gets kicked out of Long Island, gets chased across Manhattan, and then chased across New Jersey by late 1776, he is thinking he might be defeated and lose the war, and he begins adjusting. He goes to an interim step, this war of post. I'll pull back into forts and see if my soldiers can fight better and pull from forts in a defensive posture than they can attacking the British who come back at them with bayonet charges. That doesn't work either. And he finally realizes, I need to use the tools I have. And I can't just be disappointed with the militia because they're not like regular soldiers. I need to figure out what they're good at and use them to do those tasks. What it turns out the militia is very good at is fighting in familiar farms and fields and woods, areas they know where they can gather intelligence, they know alternate routes, and they're very good at nibbling away at British small units, at foraging parties, and at supply lines. And that's when Washington starts to see success. The British are shocked at how successful Washington and the militias are in frittering down the British force in New Jersey. So in the six months after Washington's big defeats in New York, the British Army itself goes from, I think, about 34,000 to about 16,000 effective troops. Just daily losses to to, skirmishing, to desertion, to wounding, to prisoners of war, and what have you. And that's the way Washington ultimately wins the war. He he keeps his force alive. They win a big battle at Saratoga that he's not involved in. That brings in the French. And eventually, in the 1781, he can go back to a conventional fight at Yorktown because that's the more natural posture for him. And he has the French troops, money, and ships, most of all, that make him able to fight more conventionally. But he's just a fascinating figure. And how he changes and evolves, and I think probably one of America's greatest generals. I think there's no question. Washington is a strong believer in civic virtue, and that, of course, is a core part of your book. 
In fact, I would say that he most likely didn't think a republic that we had just created could sustain itself without virtue. Could you explain the importance of civic virtue, at least in that period, and why Washington felt it was so essential? Virtue to them is something very different from the way we toss around the word nowadays. I mean, you hear it as mentioned at all in a phrase like a woman of easy virtue. Uh, to them, it had nothing to do with female or male sexuality. It was about being public-minded. Virtue was incredibly important to them. They used the words twice as often in their correspondence and other writings as they used the word freedom or liberty. And Washington goes into the revolution believing, yes, to have a republic, you need men of virtue. Madison comes along after the war and says something that really resonates with Washington, that virtue wasn't sufficient in the war. You need as much virtue as you can have, but you can't get by on virtue alone. And Madison's brilliant answer is, okay, instead of just hoping for virtue, let's see if we can use vice instead, self-interest, even selfishness, and use it to balance ambition against ambition, avarice against avarice. And, and this is the other key to this, if you disperse power broadly between different state and federal governments, between different branches of the federal government, between two houses in the legislative branch of federal government, disperse that power, then people can't make progress unless they reach out to others, unless they make deals, cut compromises, form alliances. And so Madison's great hope and what he builds the Constitution on is, okay, let's not, virtue is nice to have, but it's not enough. Let's balance vice with vice. And that's really the great switch that occurs between how these guys thought about virtue before the revolution and how they thought about it when they wrote the Constitution. If you did take that original view, then it would only be, the government could only succeed in the hands of very few people that had virtue. And it was exclusionary in a way. They try it uh, kind of in the Articles of Confederation government, which governs this country, through the Revolution and then until the Constitution was written at the end of the 1780s. And so the Articles of Confederation, yes, indeed, as you say, it was a very small government, it was a very weak government, and it turned out to be a very ineffective government. And the great shock was when you had Shays' Rebellion in western Massachusetts just after the Revolution. Veterans come home and find that their land is being seized for non-payment of taxes yet they haven't gotten their money owed them by the government for their service in the war because Congress can't raise the funds. So these guys are getting screwed by the ineffectiveness of the federal government. And they take matters in their own hands. They stop the seizure of property by closing the courts in western Massachusetts. And they mount a rebellion in which they go off and try to take the rifles stored at the federal arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts called us out the militia, only to have about half the militiamen join the rebels. Then the, the federal government says, we'll raise some troops. We just need the states to send us money. None of the states send money or troops. So finally, the government governor of Massachusetts raises a private army paid by rich businessmen in Boston to put down Shays Rebellion. And James Madison and others are watching this and saying, this is no way to run a government. We need a stronger central government. And that begins the drumbeat for a constitutional convention. And Madison convinces Washington to come and lend his prestige to that. And that's when they really give us a design for this country. Which leads me to the conclusion that Madison may be the second most important person among the founders. Washington wins the war, and I think and the other generals might not have won the war. But Washington gives us the country then Madison gives us the design for the country. For John Adams, he's classically educated, not only at Harvard, but he spends a lifetime of learning. The thing that I always get hung up with Adams is he spends all of his time preparing for a leadership role, and then when he gets into a leadership role, he's just not very effective. He's a lousy leader. And there's maybe certain types of political figures like that, Newt Gingrich, Bernie Sanders, who are better in opposition than they are actually in a position of power. They're better at critics than actually wielding power. 
And they tend to be very critical when they're out of power and then to be very resentful of criticism when they are in power. And Adam fits that. Adam spends his life emulating Cicero. And there's a lot to admire about Adam. Here's a guy who's the only one of the first four presidents never to own a slave. His parents don't have a lot of money. He has to earn a living immediately out of college. He goes off to a Massachusetts backwater, Worcester, Massachusetts, doesn't even have a post office. He becomes a school teacher. He hates it. And he decides he'll become a lawyer and become the American Cicero, and to his great credit, he does that. And then, as this brilliant young lawyer, very good speaker, he gets the ball of revolution rolling in New England, long before a lot of other people are even thinking about it. So there's a lot to credit there, but then he doesn't do much during the revolution, except write nagging letters to Washington to tell him he's fighting the war wrong, and Adams' letters are invariably incorrect in their strategic analysis. Then he becomes a lousy president, and as president, he decides, as we're talking about, that he shouldn't be criticized, that to criticize the president is a form of factionalism. Faction brought down the Roman Republic. So faction is like a form of treason. So he starts throwing newspaper editors into jail. Interestingly, he becomes our first one-term president. An interesting thought of we are in this interim period between two presidents right now. He's the first one-term president. He's very bitter about being turned out of public office. He makes a bunch of last-minute appointments that antagonize his successor, Thomas Jefferson. And he doesn't even attend the inauguration of Jefferson. Instead, he leaves town on the 4 a.m. coach to Baltimore. That said, he also turns over power to the opposition. There's a saying among political scientists that it's not a democracy just because you elect a president. It's a democracy when the opposition wins an election and power is turned over to them. And Adams does that. Jefferson becomes president. And Jefferson actually, I have a lot of problems with Jefferson. I think he's a huge hypocrite. But I usually admire him for the Declaration of Independence. And then also for what he says in his first inaugural address when he receives the presidency and John Adams leaves town. He says two things. He says, number one, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. That is, just because somebody disagrees with you on politics doesn't make them a bad person. And the second thing he says is, I'm not going to throw the opposition in jail. And these kind of establish norms for how we behave with our opposition in this country recognizing you can't have a one-party democracy. You really do need two parties to have a successful democracy. In regards to Thomas Jefferson, in your book you mention that he has less of an emphasis on the Romans and more on the Greeks. What does that mean for his philosophy? He's a quirky figure, Jefferson. Among them, he's the most Greek rather than Roman. He reads Greek literature at a time when people really didn't read a whole lot of the Greeks. And he takes his philosophical leanings, not from the Stoics that were so important to people like George Washington, but he takes his lead from Epicurus, the Greek philosopher who believes that life is all about avoiding pain and pursuing happiness. Now, that doesn't just mean sex, drugs, and rock and roll, although Jefferson was quite fond of women, good wine, and good music. For Jefferson, it also meant prudence, wisdom, moderation, the pursuit of justice, a lot of the words that show up in the Declaration of Independence. But the word happiness leads. It's very important in the Declaration, especially at the beginning. So all his life, he considers himself an Epicurean. And this is a little bit of a scandal to some other people. For Jeffersonian democracy, can it work with virtue? Can it work when you have tons of people, almost like the rabble is now... Uh, has political power. Well, this is the great shock of the 1790s, that John Adams really had not taken on the meaning of the phrase in the Constitution that begins it, we the people. The people actually held power. The great unwashed. And in fact, at one point, Adams says to his cousin, the revolutionary Samuel Adams, the people have part of the sovereignty. And Samuel Adams writes back, no, John, the people have all of the sovereignty. The people own the country. And the great surprise to the founding generation is the people take this ball and run with it. They take it seriously. We are going to run this country. And you get the rise of the the first political party, the first opposition party, with Madison and Jefferson leading the way in the 1790s. 
And even that kind of outruns Madison and Jefferson. The American people take on that they are in charge. And frankly, they don't have a lot of time for the classics. They are busy with the lives they have. They don't look back to Rome and Greece so much. And actually, they kind of have their own heroes, Washington foremost. And the country becomes very different very quickly in the 1790s and the 1810s. For James Madison, then, we've talked about him a great deal. I guess that is what you concluded in part in your book and your research, is that he is ultimately important. In that complicated system of shared power that he helps design, how do we keep that from deviating to what is more traditional, which they had known before, and to tyranny and so forth? These were questions very much on Madison's mind and other people. Remember Montesquieu, the French philosopher, is a real bridge between the ancient world and the founding generation. He writes The Spirit of Laws, his masterpiece, and about, I would say, one-third of that, at least, is about Roman history. And in fact, before he wrote that book, he wrote another, an earlier one, that was a study of the greatness and the decline of Rome. So he is very much steeped in Rome and so on. But he also is looking forward, and Montesquieu kind of designed the liberal democratic state, a state based on tolerance, justice, division of power, trying to balance equality with justice, that believes very much in freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. And they take a lot of their clues from Montesquieu. In fact, if you go and look, Founders Online, they refer to Montesquieu about twice as much, I think, as they refer to John Locke, who we were incorrectly taught in high school was so important. He was important, but I don't think he's half as important as Montesquieu. So Madison especially says, how do we have a large republic that can live on? And his basic answer is, number one, dispersion of power. And it generally works. I would say the problem they see for us is not drifting towards tyranny, but drifting towards oligarchy. Mm. I think they, they would come back now and criticize us and say, We did not design this country for the 1% to run American politics. We did not design this country for the wealthy to regulate Congress. And you people are in danger of drifting from democracy and toward oligarchy, making the dollar more important than the vote, and that is not what we designed. I was going to ask you about that next, actually, the impact of the rise of the market economy. Does this result in Americans then valuing competition of profit over the proliferation of American democracy? I think it does. I think that's long been a strain in American history, and especially the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has overvalued property and the respect for property and undervalued the common good. There's two references in the Constitution to the general welfare. In fact, at both times, it's like the common defense and the general welfare. We spend a lot of money on the common defense. We don't pay much attention or spend much money on the general welfare in the way they thought of it. I think they would be shocked, especially at how we've dropped the ball in the last year on public health. Nothing is more fundamental to the general welfare than public health. Yet for the last year, it's as if we had an Articles of Confederation government in which the governors scramble around trying to deal with this epidemic. And the central government does very little to help out. So they would, I think, say you need to reconsider some of the things we wrote. But I think they'd also criticize us and say, hey, we designed this thing to be amended. They'd be very pleased that the constitutional system has lasted for 250-odd years. I think they'd be shocked, though, that we haven't changed it. That in the first century of American history, they made a lot of, we had to make a lot of changes to the Constitution. In the second century, not so much. And there are changes that they didn't anticipate. The differences between the big states and the small states has gotten much bigger. Virginia was 12 times the population of Delaware when they wrote the Constitution. I think now California is like 50 times the size of the population of Wyoming. If you go back and look at the writing of the Constitution, they sat around and talked about these things, and then they went out for a few beers. They made it up. (laughs) So they said, you know, Hey, who should run impeachment? They have a debate one day. Should it be impeachment be handled by the Supreme Court or by the Congress? And they decide the Congress, that's more representative of the people. 
should the presidency be one person, two people, or three people? They discuss that, but get rid of it pretty quickly because someone says, you know, these triumvirates didn't work out well for the Romans. Let's go with one person in the presidency. So once you know kind of how fluid it was to them, it's easier to think about changing the Constitution. Like, I think we should have 18-year terms for the Supreme Court. Hamilton, by the way, shows up one day at the Constitutional Convention and gives a speech in which he advocates both the Senate and the presidency should be for life. Well, that's very close to monarchy right there. Of course, they dismiss it, and they say Hamilton, as usual, is you know, talking a good game, but doesn't have really have it, and he leaves, and they don't pay attention to it. So I think we could also visit things like uh, how many, how many uh, senators a state has. California has the same number of senators as Wyoming. This is profoundly undemocratic and deprives equal representation of the people of California. Maybe the biggest third of states should have three senators, and the middle third two, and the smallest third one. That would also address the problem of the Electoral College. I don't advocate getting rid of things easily, and maybe instead of getting rid of the Electoral College, we should tinker with it and you know, give the big states more votes in the Electoral College, which would be reflected by the number of senators they had. What would they think about the huge amounts of money in political campaigns? I think they would be shocked, unhappy, and they would say that that they were taught that the two things that brought down the Roman Republic were factionalism and corruption. And they would say what you're doing with money in politics is a form of corruption, and a profound corruption, that it's not just letting money sway political decisions. It takes away, it erodes democracy and makes America a less democratic place. And I think many of them, certainly Madison and Jefferson, I think would support a constitutional amendment to get rid of the uh, Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, that basically says corporations have all the rights of people in politics. That This is something that was made up. First of all, it's a bizarre legal fiction in America that a corporation is a person. And then there's this additional thought that corporations have all the rights of people in politics. Well, corporation, the word corporation doesn't appear in the Constitution. So all that is interpretation by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has, I think, made many more bad decisions in shaping America than good ones. I think the Dred Scott decision in the middle of the 19th century that says black people have no rights, but white people have to respect, is a horrible decision. And then Plessy v. Ferguson at the end of the 19th century that says segregation is great, no problem, and it has this fiction of separate but equal. And everybody knows it's not equal. So there's this lie this country lives under. And I think Citizens United is as damaging to this country as those decisions were. Or almost as as damaging, I would say. When you started researching, you said as you completed the book, you gained more admiration for Washington and Madison and not as much for Adams and Jefferson. Is that how you started? Did you think that was going to happen? I did not expect it to happen. I thought of Washington as a fairly dull, conventional thinker. I think he's actually a much more observant thinker, and in some ways ahead of the game in political philosophy, as he sees the limits of virtue and writes about that in the middle of the revolution. And Madison I didn't know much about. I really came just to to enjoy Little Jimmy Madison, as they called him, he was about five foot, five foot one, you know, 110 pounds, sickly, had some form of epilepsy. We don't know quite what. Not a good speaking voice yet, and, and not a particularly um, memorable writer. No, there are no great phrases that we really remember from his writings, except maybe his observation that if men were angels, we wouldn't need a government. But Madison has such an important effect that I think he is second only to Washington. Washington gives us the country, and then Madison, as I said, designs the country, the house we live in nationally. The opposite, though, with Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. John Adams, with all respect for your uh, your county, named for his <laughs> named for his son. John Adams, I think, has had a very inflated reputation in recent years, partly because of the David McCullough's biography, which was a very nice book about his marriage to Abigail Adams. But I think really a much rosier view than Adams deserved. And then the miniseries that was, uh, HBO did starring Paul Giamatti, who kind of presented Adams as a little teddy bear. And he's not. Uh, he was an irascible guy, incredibly vain, brilliant and honest, 
and a lousy president. Jefferson, I have the biggest problem with. I, I had come into writing the book kind of an admirer of Jefferson. I was raised as a kid by my parents to revere Thomas Jefferson as second only to George Washington. And the problem I have with him is not that he was a slaveholder. M- many of them were slaveholders. The problem I have with him is he's such a big hypocrite that he talks a good game about liberty. He even talks a good game about slavery when he's living in Paris. But he never does anything about it. So to me, Thomas Jefferson is like that giant marshmallow man in Ghostbusters. Uh, he's sort of big. You can never get your arms around him. But when you poke him, you just get softness. He kind of recedes into the distance, the opposite of Washington. And I think this is because of his Epicureanism and also his kind of romanticism. He's an early romantic before romanticism really has become a thing. He often will privilege the heart over the head in a way that, say, Washington does not. Washington is very much a man of the age of reason. And he allows himself this vast gap between what he says about liberty and what he does about liberty. He writes about liberty when outside his window there are captive human beings that he treats as his property. One of the horrifying things he writes is in one of his letters he says to someone that they grow enough food on his farm to feed all the animals, including including the Negroes. Mm. I know that many people in that time period were not educated. The elite, of course, uh, many of them were, or that was expected. But nowadays, there's just so much information. I, I remember when in the 90s when the inter- internet was really developing. I remember the, the very first time I encountered something like Google. I was at the language school <laughs> in Monterey, California, and somebody said, you know, if you go to the library, you can just type something in and it gives you an answer. I'm like, what? Because uh, you just have to go to books. Yeah. That's the first time I remember it. I think there was this belief that now we're all going to be better for it, that you can get information immediately and, and then the human race is just going to move to another level of maybe even consciousness. I don't, I'm not even sure. That has not been the case. What do you think the founders would make of all of this information just so readily available and misinformation? I think Thomas Jefferson would have loved it. He loved just to wallow in facts. I think the others would have said, eh, it's a different form of information. I notice this. I like to sail on the ocean, and especially alone. And when I'm sailing on the ocean, I'm constantly receiving information every second from my eyes, from my ears. You can even smell the difference in water sometimes because if water, if a current is coming up to the surface from, from deep, the deep, it'll have a different smell to it. You're constantly feeling the wind. It feels different on either side of your head, depending on where the wind's coming from. So I feel like I'm getting a million emails a second when I'm out sailing, and paying attention to the weather and the water and the currents in my sail and the animals I see in the ocean about me. I would say that these guys would say that they were going through a much more disruptive era than we are, that what you saw in the late 18th century in the early 19th century the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which brought enormous change, the steam engine, the fact that suddenly you could start moving things without depending on human or animal muscle, on land especially. And then in the 19th century, the rise of the railroad and the telegraph enormously changed the velocity of goods and of information. I think that the Internet is simply a more colorful version of the telegraph. So it was a huge difference when Ulysses S. Grant went off to West Point, and instead of having to ride a horse, as somebody of the previous generation would, he was able to get in a railroad carriage that traveled at 20 miles an hour for a full 24 hours. That was extraordinary. So especially when we're talking about the founders, when we talk about social media being disruptive nowadays, I would argue that newspapers, the rise of the political newspaper in the 1790s, was much more disruptive than anything that social media has done in this country recently. Remember, it changes the nature of American public life. You have the rise of political parties expressed basically through the existence of these new newspapers. So you have a political party system emerging. You have newspapers that are critical of the president in a way that rarely had been seen anywhere in the world. And you have John Adams reacting by throwing newspaper editors into jail which very well could have become 
the norm in America, and we would have had a very different country. So they are addressing fundamental questions about information and data and how we behave. I think we simply have fancier, more colorful, more entertaining versions of the disruptions they had. You list a number of steps to help combat some of the current political ills in America. Could you explain some of these steps and how we can resurrect maybe a focus on virtue, which seems almost to be extinct, and get Americans to agree on some core principles? Similar to what Jefferson said, we can have different approaches, but we can still be for democracy. Exactly. And I kind of worry about that when I saw all these congressmen recently join in a lawsuit to throw out the results of the election. That's not. That is a, in a doing so, it wasn't because they were, judges had decided, had again and again examined the evidence and found no evidence of fraud. So to assert fraud where there was no evidence of it, I think, was to undermine faith in the American system, and I think was deeply unpatriotic. I think we have to reconsider the value we put on the market. The market is the direct opposite of virtue. And we, just as virtue was a god for the founding generation, we have made market much too much of a god in our own decisions. We allow the market even to decide life and death issues. We are the only major industrialized country that has this huge for-profit healthcare sector that makes decisions about life and death. There's got to be a different approach to that. So I think less market, more virtue. The market is not always the answer. And I think if you have less emphasis on the market, maybe with that, less respect for money. We respect money too much in this country. I would much rather have somebody's donation of time. I respect a donation of time to a charity much more than I respect a donation of money. Because when I see rich people donating money nowadays, I think, well, they're giving a fraction of what they should give in their taxes. But because they have bought Congress and bought presidencies and cut their taxes, they are taking much too much of American wealth. You know, for the last 30 or 40 years in this country, the middle class has been flatlining in income, and all gains in new wealth have gone to the top 1%. That's not a good way to run a country. But it comes if you value market too much, the market too much, and you confuse being wealthy with being wise. And I think they would be appalled, the founders, to see that we have come to this pass right now. But I think they also, if they came back today, would be very pleased with the resiliency of the American system, to see that the Constitution has held. I think they'd be critical, as I said, that we haven't changed it more and made amendments that they put in the machine. I think they also, and i got to mention this, I, I think they'd be very embarrassed to see what a mess they made of slavery. I'm not sure there was any other way forward for them, but they wrote slavery into the Constitution. It's not a stain on the American fabric. It is part of the American fabric, and we're still pulling that out of the American fabric, that, that weaving they did. And even now, there are people who don't seem persuaded that black people are first-class American citizens. For that focus on the market, what do you think Alexander Hamilton would think? Because I think Jefferson's perspective or Madison's perspective, if they were to come back today, would be very different than Hamilton's. Hamilton is such an interesting figure and such a tragic figure. I think Hamilton would agree more with the emphasis on the market. He was very much a man of the market and understood financial markets very well. But remember that he went very quickly from being a key power in America, basically George Washington's prime minister, to by the end of the 1790s, feeling that there was no place in America for him, that he didn't recognize this new emerging America. So it's interesting that this guy would place such emphasis on financial markets as he sees a populism and a market-oriented country emerge, feel there's a place for him in it anymore, and then is himself killed by the vice president. My last question for you today, Mr. Ricks, you've spoken a few just in passing about some of these things. What are some practical things, some things that we could actually do to rediscover some of that virtue or place a greater emphasis on a American democracy or even strengthen the current system that we have? I think, first of all, we need to listen to each other more, not just to score points off them, but under, to understand what other people are saying and, and thinking and why they say that and think that. Second, I think we need to 
talk a bit more about virtue and the common good, the general welfare, and a little bit less about what the market is and, and market incentives. The market shouldn't even dominate all economic decisions, but let alone moral decisions, which is where we have placed it now. The market is the, is the king of our decision making, and I think especially in the Supreme Court's ruling. Third, I think we could all benefit by going back and actually reading line by line the Constitution and seeing what's there and what is not there. And I think an emphasis on the general welfare, the public good, would be generally good. I'm talking here not just about public health, which has been our minds this year, but also the environment and public safety are all things of the common good, all things that we should be investing in. And certainly not auctioning off to the highest bidder in the market saying it's okay for a corporation to pollute as long as they pay a big fine. The political aspect of it, though, obviously we talked about the money. Those are very difficult. But if you think of structural changes that could happen, you mentioned some about the Electoral College, for example. In the last number of elections, if you take the history of the country, there was very few times where someone lost the popular vote and ended up winning the Electoral College. In the last few years, it's happened, though, on a few occasions. What are some structural changes to the Electoral College that could be made? I'm a little bit wary of simply getting rid of the Electoral College. It is a shock absorber built into the system. Before you get rid of things like that, that maybe help with stability, just consider them. For example, I never thought about until this last two weeks, the interesting fact that states, run elections for federal office. It doesn't seem logical. Shouldn't the federal government run elections for federal office? But here, thanks again to James Madison and the dispersal of power generally, no, states run elections. Totally. Imagine how different we would feel right now if Donald Trump simply were able to declare the election invalid, if that was a federal power. So, an election to federal office, the president says the election is unfair. Instead, you had 50 different states run it, 50 different forms of litigation going on, state secretaries of state in each state saying, no, I'm certifying that this was a well-run, clear election, and if you have any evidence to the contrary, produce it now, and nobody did. So there are a lot of things, there's a lot of genius built into the system, and I'd be careful of taking it out. But as I said, one reason you're getting this discrepancies between the popular vote and the outcome of the vote is this problem that Small states have as many senators as the big states, and this skews it. So Wyoming, with its two senators, has 25 times the influence in the Senate. And because your number of electoral votes is your House of Representatives numbers plus your two senators, these very low population big states that are west of the Mississippi and north of Texas have too much influence in the Electoral College, and it is undemocratic. And I'm not saying we should change that, but we should certainly start thinking about it and perhaps hold a constitutional convention at some point and make more of a practice of changing the Constitution, as was the practice in the first hundred years of this country's history. Thank you very much, Mr. Ricks. I really appreciate it. That was very informative and I think a great discussion for this time period. As Confucius said, may we live in interesting times. Great. I appreciate your having me. I would like to thank my guest today, Thomas Ricks, for such a fascinating discussion on the classical education of the founding generation. If you would like to get his book, First Principles, just click on the link in the description below. I have to warn you, though, it is close to selling out, so get your copy soon. The featured brew was Samuel Adams Limited Released Winter Lager from the Samuel Adams Brewery of Boston, Massachusetts. If you liked our conversation today, please share the episode with a friend and remember to subscribe to the podcast. Simply hit the subscribe button on the podcast directory that you use and get new episodes immediately after they are released. Subscribing is the only way to get new shows right away. The music was provided by the band Bones Fork, who are producing new material as we speak, and we're looking forward to that as we've said before. And to the growing list of listeners from 40 countries and hundreds of cities across the United States, I would like to say thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way with discussions on the 80s baseball rivalry between the Mets and the Cardinals, the gatekeeper for FDR, a discussion on Ulysses S. Grant. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. History of Go-Go.